fire and ashes, dramatic craters, exotic creatures and captivating people. Life in a landscape of extremes in southern Japan. Scaling the volcano inside Unzen National Park takes hours. The path is steep and treacherous. As part of their annual ritual, Shinto priests from the town of Unzen and members of their congregation trek to the volcano's peak, to the shrine of the goddess. The priests must carry her down to the valley for the harvest festival. She should be kept in good spirits to appease the volcano. For Shinto priest Hirose, the volcano peak is the ideal location for the shrine, despite the danger. All mountains are considered holy, but this is a very special place because the goddess resides here. Indeed. But major eruptions 20 years ago buried her shrine in tons of lava and debris. The congregation needed a new one. Several years passed, however, before a building permit for Unzen National Park was finally granted. Not even the gods are spared from bureaucracy. <laughs> The small ceremony is rounded off with sake, Japanese rice wine, and dried fish. <laughs> sake is the drink of the gods, but we also make food offerings. We share both with the goddess. If we partake of the blessed food, the goddess may bestow us with fortune in return. Shinto is practiced only in Japan. Its realm of gods is unlimited. This figure, a bodhisattva, comes from Buddhism. Now the heavy statue must be safely transported down to the valley, not exactly an easy task. Carrying the statue down the volcano is a service to the goddess. If we take the risk and master the difficult descent, the goddess will grant us her favor and possibly bless us with luck in return. Under no circumstances may the deity be dropped. This would be a very bad omen. At close to 1,500 meters, the Heisei Shinzan is the highest peak in the Unzan Massif. Shimabara, a city of 140,000, lies at the foot of the volcano. 200 years ago, an eruption destroyed the entire city. And just over 20 years ago, the volcano raged once again. On the 3rd of July, 1991, a pyroclastic flow races towards the city. This 500 degrees Celsius avalanche of gas and lava rumbles down the mountain. Large parts of Shimabara are evacuated. But 43 people, scientists, camera crews and firefighters remain inside the danger zone. No one survives. Kyushu is the southernmost of Japan's four main islands. Three mighty volcanoes, the Unzen, the Sakurajima and the Aso, dominate the island.
The Aso lies at the center of an enormous caldera, a volcanic cauldron more than 20 kilometers in diameter. Coarse erosion hints at the volcano's innards. The Aso is never dormant. It's simply more active at some times than at others. Yesterday, the volcano suddenly became very restless. Researchers from Kyoto University monitor the volcano around the clock. They're alarmed. There's a significant increase in the concentration of sulfurous and putrid smelling gases. Minor earthquakes have also been registered. Many signs point to an imminent eruption. Using a thermal imaging camera, they want to check if the temperature of the released gases has also increased. It's difficult to say when the next major eruption will occur, but even the smaller ones can be hazardous. Many visitors get close to the crater. That's risky. The concentration of toxic gases is very high at the moment, so we can't allow visitors into this area. Time and again, gas poisoning has taken human lives here. The crater is the main attraction at Aso National Park, but for now, it remains off limits to visitors. A bubbling lake has formed inside the crater. The water down there is extremely acidic. Its pH value is only 0.4. That means this lake is made of acid. Scientists have installed numerous measuring devices along the crater's edge. They must now check each and every one of them. A single malfunction could have fatal consequences. They're checking the surveillance camera's power supply. One of their research aims is to predict future eruptions. Up to now, this has been nearly impossible. As scientists, we try to estimate when the next eruption will occur. But even if we do succeed in predicting eruptions, we won't be able to prevent them. Nature is just so much mightier than man. I witnessed the great Unzen eruptions that began in 1991. Many people died back then. I thought to myself, maybe my research could help prevent people from losing their lives to volcanoes in the future. At the end of their rounds, the two scientists examine the thermal imaging results. The temperature of the gases is not significantly above average. This means the likelihood of an eruption anytime soon is minimal. But no one can be certain. The mighty Aso plays by its own rules and pays no heed to human life. The goddess has survived the perilous journey and arrives safely in the town of Unzen. This effigy of the goddess is new. The old one was destroyed during the last great eruption. But according to the priest, the essence of the goddess remains the same. Further to the back, if possible. That's fine. During the great eruptions, the congregation prayed to Hirose to appease the volcano with ceremonies. All his efforts were in vain. The volcano continued to rage for five more years. There are natural disasters and there are good days. The gods not only give, they also punish. I stopped thinking about the gods' decisions long ago. In the priest's house, 
the women from the congregation are busy preparing the banquet. The priest's wife, Makiko Hirose, is in charge. Everybody helps and is in a good mood. It's no hassle at all. The women from the congregation closely monitor her every move. If she makes a mistake, it will reflect on her husband. But she would never admit this in public. All in all, it's pretty demanding. I'm being watched all of the time. I have to see that the parish council and all the members of the women's organizations are happy. Nothing must go wrong during the festival. It's no easy task. Then her husband suddenly appears in the kitchen, something he normally never does. Thank you for all your support. How's everything going? Everything's fine. Stress for the wife. Always keep smiling and never let anything show. Four hours later, the ceremonial meal is ready. Nothing with four legs may be served. The women are responsible for the drinks too. Every glass must be full at all times. I was worried that something might go wrong. But thank goodness, everything went well. Unzen volcano has not spouted any ashes for 20 years now. Still, every morning, father and son Jinkawa peer into the sky. The weather is going to be fine today. We'll use lots of salt and some more water. Okay. Okay. Every detail must be just right when making good soma noodles, and the Jinkawas make the best. For four generations, the family has been producing these typical Japanese noodles. Each of the ingredients is somehow connected to the volcano. Spring water from the slopes of the Unzen, wheat flour from the region. The whole family helps in the business. Even the manager's 84-year-old mother does her bit. Every morning, she rubs the dough with linseed oil. In Japan, soma noodles are a true delicacy. Getting them right takes years of experience. The boss doesn't feel his son is up to the task quite yet. He's been doing it for only 10 years now, so it's too early to call him a professional. The son fully agrees with his father. I don't know what it's like with other families, but my father never compliments me on my work. He's always criticizing me. That's how it is in our family. Becoming a master in Japan is no easy task. Throughout the day, the dough is drawn and twisted into thinner and thinner strands. Humidity plays a key role in the process. The dough must not tear. The manager rarely treats himself to time out with his wife and grandson. But he wants the little boy to know about his home. The hot bubbling springs are part of it. The Buddhist monks who first settled in this region in the 8th century called it the Hell of Unzen. The manager has been away for several hours now, but he's not worried because he knows he can rely on his son. He would never tell him that, however. Yes, it's true, I never compliment him. If I think he's done something well, I say, so, so. That's my way of paying a compliment. It's just the way I am. <laughs> my husband never praises anyone, not even me. <laughs> The hot springs feed into the public baths of Unzen town. When the manager was a child, his father used to take him to this bathhouse. 
Now he's carrying on the tradition with his grandson. What do you want to be when you grow up? A salmon noodle maker. That was the correct and only answer for his grandfather. <laughs> 130 kilometers to the south lies Sakurajima, fondly referred to as Cherry Blossom Island. It's acting up once again. Volcanologists fear a large and possibly devastating eruption in the near future. Dusk is falling upon Sakurajima. Time for photographer Takehito Mayatake to get up. The photographer spends his days sleeping in his car near the volcano. At night, he takes pictures and shoots videos. Once a month, Takehito makes the 10-hour trip to the volcano. He has even sold some of his pictures. But that's not what it's about for him. You might say, He's obsessed with the volcano. I'm always very excited. I have to be here. Whenever I come here, I see totally new views of the volcano. That's what keeps me going. Takehito will spend the entire night next to his camera. It's far too exciting to sit down. Six seconds. That's how long it takes for the sound wave to reach him after an explosion. If he hears it first, it's too late to press the shutter. These are fantastic images. Rocks and sand are rubbing against each other and causing electrical discharges. The flashes create a blue light. Red glowing rocks through blue light, a really rare shot. Takehito has been lucky but he's not about to call it a day. Another, even better explosion could be just around the corner. The winds carry the ashes from Sakurajima volcano over vast distances. Now and again, the Japanese macaques suffer from the ashes. Some cough, some sneeze, others develop skin rashes but today appears to be a good day. A boat carrying researchers from Kyoto University lands on Monkey Island. The macaques know whenever the researchers come, something special usually happens. Many years ago, researchers began feeding the monkeys to get them used to humans. Even though feeding wild animals is quite controversial, the data obtained here is unparalleled. Actually, it's almost impossible to weigh wild monkeys. That's why the data we're collecting here is so special. We can now work out how the monkeys' weight varies during the course of their lives. One of the research aims is to discover how large an area monkeys need to sustain themselves without coming into conflict with humans. 
The researchers can tell the monkeys apart by their facial features. That's how they know who's already been weighed. A special treat is saved for last, sweet potatoes. These once made the monkeys of Miyazaki famous. On one occasion, they were fed dirty potatoes. The researchers marveled at what the macaques did next. A female began cleaning the potatoes in the seawater. Soon other females followed her lead. They learned through observation. The monkeys showed they could develop their own culture, something humans thought only they themselves could do. There's no clear boundary between monkeys and humans. It's a very blurry line. You know, the more we get to know about monkeys, the more similarities and differences we can recognize. During the course of its history, the Unzen volcano has brought death and destruction. The constant threat always resonates at the Shinto festival, which today is reaching its climax. Many are praying in the temple. They want to be as close as possible to the goddess, who was in their village for only a short while. Those who fail to find a place inside the temple try to attract the goddess's attention with money. Without money, visitors are idle in the eyes of the gods, and those considered idle shall find no fortune. Shinto priest Hirose is quite pleased by the large number of visitors who have come to pray to the volcano goddess. The volcano is a great blessing for us. Of course, we're also afraid of it, because it has caused so many deaths. What's important, however, is not fear, but rather all the things the volcano gives us. Outside, rice cakes are given away as presents. Originally, they were intended for the children, but not many have turned up. Now, everybody is helping themselves. Further down the valley, the somen noodles, now drawn into long, twisted strands, are hung up to dry. The manager's wife, along with the rest of the family, helps create this Japanese delicacy. 50 grams of the highest quality cost around $5. The master completes the final step himself. The rest is automatic. A final critical examination with particular focus on the work of his son. Well, that's better. They've come out quite well. What do you think? <laughs> Not too bad. Three generations of Jinkawas live under one roof. It's the traditional Japanese way of life. Pleasant for the elders, but not always for the young. The daughter-in-law works the hardest, but has the least say. For his excellent noodles, Jinkawa received an award from the emperor, the Tenno. Encouragement to become even better. <laughs> I'm the first man of my trade to receive an award from the emperor. It's a great honor, but also a duty. I'm responsible for passing on our craft to the next generation. No volcano on Kyushu, the southernmost of Japan's four main islands, has impacted the landscape as dramatically as Aso. This symmetrical volcanic cone, named Little Rice Ball, 
was formed 3,000 years ago. During a super eruption 90,000 years ago, the volcano spouted massive amounts of ash and lava into the air. Rainfalls then washed the ashes into the Ariake Sea, covering its seabed with a thick layer of mud. The fertile volcanic mud is home to a vast army of crabs, including the Japanese sentinel crab. They use their claws to attract females and scare off potential competitors. Conflicts usually revolve around territorial disputes. The burrows of these two fiddler crabs are too close together. Trouble is just around the corner. They're called fiddler crabs because when they eat, they look like they're playing the fiddle. Mudskippers are perfectly adapted to life in the mudflats. The amphibious fish can live underwater and on land. But here too, quarrels over feeding grounds are commonplace. The mudflats are simply too densely populated. Meddlesome crabs are another annoyance for the mudskippers. At stake here, an escape hole with a depth of up to 1.8 meters. Crabs may be an occasional nuisance, but herons pose a serious threat. But mudskippers face another, even bigger, two-legged predator. This one isn't content with a small catch. All his life, he has pursued one single goal, and many mudskippers have lost their lives for it. I wanted to be better than everyone else and find the mudskippers no one else could find. Michihiro Harada is 67 years old and the best mudskipper hunter around. He catches up to 600 mudskippers per day. No one else comes close. Mudskippers are really smart and fast. They know right away whether you're a good fisherman or a bad one. They move differently depending on whether I approach them with or without a fishing rod. The air in the mudflats is hot and humid. Further out, the surface is infested with billions of blood-sucking insects. Navigating through the mudflats atop his board is terribly exhausting, and keeping his balance proves a real challenge. Harada glides two kilometers out onto the mudflats, where the big mudskippers live. It's a strenuous journey no one else dares to embark on. You have to approach them carefully, or they notice you. Nature is my opponent, and it's not easy to win. He spends about four hours atop his board. If he slides off, he would sink waist deep into the mud. The hook flies over the mudskipper and catches it on the way back. Harada uses the same fishing techniques from 300 years ago, when the shogun still ruled Japan. It's the only way to catch mudskippers. Another long day in the mudflats, in the shadows of the volcanoes. The mudflats appearance changes almost every day. It's probably from the ashes 
that stick to the surface and are slowly washed away with the tide. Less than 60 kilometers away, at the base of the Kuju Volcano Crater in Aso National Park, the volcano is belching clouds of smoke unrelentingly. Yet the crater appears to have cooled down. This unique wetland is located high atop a plateau, a vast grassland that gleams golden in autumn. But the grassland and all its flowers are endangered. Dense forests envelop the plateau's slopes. To prevent the forests from taking over the grasslands, a system of controlled burning is used. Once a year, hundreds of volunteers come together to burn down the grassland. The flames scorch only the surface. The grass roots remain unharmed. Next spring, grass will grow again where flames are now ablaze. It's the only means of preserving this ancient landscape. Not far away, on the volcano's slope, the rice harvest has begun. Farmer Kazuhiro Tokimatsu's fields are small. Using machines makes no sense. His concept of agriculture dates back to the old Japan. He's eager to pass on this concept to his helpers. No artificial fertilizers and biological pest control only. Tokimatsu believes it's vital to remain close to one's roots. Now the soil is hard. But in springtime, it'll be very muddy. When I step onto it with my feet, I'll have the same feeling my father and my grandfather used to have all those years ago. The soil preserves ancestral ties. In the afternoon, the rice that was cut three days ago is hung up to dry on another patch of land. After another eight days, the grain will be separated from the chaff. It's painstaking work, but Tokimatsu wants to adhere to these traditional Japanese methods of harvesting. Compared with the old days, we live in paradise, yet lots of people commit suicide. There are many university graduates, but they're not necessarily doing well. Loneliness and depression are on the rise. I think people have moved too far away from what's important. They're no longer connected to the soil. Today, everybody is finishing work early. They have to get dressed for the rice harvest festival in the village. Meanwhile, at home on the farm, Tokimatsu's wife Reiko is preparing a rice snack for the festival. She's cooking over a wood fire. It's better and cheaper than an electric rice cooker. With the cooker, I only have to press a button. But with the fire, I have to enter into a relationship. The flames have a calming and healing effect on me. The rice balls are meant for the festival dancers. Tokimatsu will also dance in front of the Shinto shrine this evening. White is the color of purity and of their ceremonial garb. In the village, the rice harvest festival is the biggest event of the year. It's a very old tradition. In spring, we pray for a good harvest, and in autumn, we express our gratitude. In the countryside, we're used to living together with the gods. Suddenly, everyone's in a hurry. Tokimatsu is late.
In front of the village shrine, Okagura is being performed, ancient dances and music of the Shinto religion. An evil spirit wants to draw the children to the other side, but naturally they resist. The Okagura is meant to appease the gods. Tokimatsu fortifies himself with a rice ball. He will perform in several roles tonight. Everybody is swept away by the play of the gods. It's a wonderful day. <laughs> How true. The weather's nice. The harvest is plentiful. What else could you ask for? Tokimatsu plays the most important role in the Okagura performance. He has to free the sun goddess, who is being held captive behind a rock. Many parents in the countryside believe a dance with the god brings good luck to their children. But the children don't always enjoy the ride. This one remains calm. At the end of the play, the sun goddess is freed. Tokimatsu can hope for another good harvest in the coming year. From the volcano back to the Ariaki Sea, it owes its abundance of fish to the volcano's ashes. The tidal range here measures six meters. Only at low tide does the Ariaki Sea reveal its vast, muddy underground, which extends to the horizon. The mudskippers appear in a flash, and wherever they are, fisherman Harada can't be far away. Every day, School classes get to experience firsthand how difficult it is to move across the mud like the fishermen do. They take part in sliding competitions to the poles and back. Some get the hang of it quickly. Others not at all. Meanwhile, the fisherman's wife is preparing yesterday's catch for sale. She soaked the fish in water for a whole day to get the mud out of their bodies. Countless mudskippers have passed through her hands. They're cute in my hands. The way they are now, so cute. I say to them, forgive me. I'm very sorry my husband caught you. But I have to do this. <laughs> Mudskippers are a delicacy. Kinuyo Harada charges 1,000 yen, or around $10, for a bundle of 10 fish. For 40 years, she has been grilling mudskippers and only mudskippers, no other kind of fish. Some might consider this monotonous, but not her. No, my husband catches only mudskippers, mudskippers, over and over again. And I take pride in grilling them for my husband. <laughs> In the evening, Fisherman Harada returns home with the mudskippers for the following day. His traditional style of fishing is extremely exhausting, especially for someone pushing 70 like him. By now, I've learned everything there is to know about mudskippers. I can gauge their behavior. And when I come across a nice one, I just have to catch it. Before he became the best, he thought about quitting. But now, he's become a true master. Retiring would be utterly foolish.
The children are running out of time. The tide is rising. One last round of tug of war before the sea puts an end to today's fun. Once the tide is in, it's all over for today. Now it's time to get the mud off. A high pressure hose is the only way. Fifty kilometers further south, the Sakurajima volcano has not calmed down. With relentless force, it spews ashes and even boulders into the air. Photographer Takehito has been standing in front of the volcano for days, concentrated and enraptured. There was a large eruption this morning, and I got some nice shots. Right now, visibility is really bad. Those high ash clouds are shrouding the mountain. Takehito quickly saves his good shots. They're among his best ever. What I like about this one, you can see the large rock that was hurled into the air. It's about 1.5 meters in diameter. This is really exciting. The Sakurajima volcano has cast a spell on the photographer. It's like having a lover who lives far away. I can't always be with her, but still I want to see her red fire over and over again. For Takahito, parting is always difficult. His sole consolation, in a month's time, he'll be back again. Hundred kilometers to the north at the Unzen Massif, the weather has turned. It's been raining for hours. According to Shinto priest Hirose, it usually rains every time the goddess is carried back to the volcano summit. Taking leave from the people saddens her. But the festival is now over, and the priest has grown weary of caring for the goddess. Gods are not supposed to live among humans. They live in the mountains, on the volcanoes, where nature's power reigns. Man will never be able to conquer these mighty volcanoes. We live from their grace. That's why we should treat nature and its powers with reverence. Uh,